Good evening. My name is Johanna Kolinen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Do join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. The submarine, the helicopter and atomic power are all inventions in some way inspired by the fictional works of authors like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Fiction can also be a way to explore future consequences and possibilities of scientific findings. But how important is this exchange of ideas for science? How does the way science is portrayed in popular culture affect the public perception of scientific research? And what could be some of the next big scientific leaps that we are imagining in popular culture today? Here to discuss these exciting topics are Sara Ilstedt, Professor of Product and Service Design, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Joachim Vrethed, lecturer, Department of English, Stockholm University, and Sabine Höhler, Associate Professor of Science and Technology Studies at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, which is here in Stockholm. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sara, so, mm. you've studied the process of design and innovation uh, for a long time. How important is the influence of fiction and popular culture in these fields? Well, I don't think it could be overestimated. It's it's actually huge. Uh, both uh, a long time ago, like Chilvern and H.G. Wells that you mentioned, but also more recently in uh, science fiction and, uh, for example, uh, Gibson, William Gibson. And the, I, the, there is a need for, for a vision that can inspire scientists and researchers and also uh, for ideas that could be shared by many people so they walk in the same direction. And I think that one of the... Uh, that I remember myself was when, when uh, Gibson wrote the book Neo Romancer and he launched the word cyberspace to describe this very vague but sort of intriguing digital world where everything floated and how this was so inspiring and thousands of computer scientists all over the world actually went about to realize this. So. Uh, yeah, this is that is very exciting, and it's also you're pointing at something interesting here, which is, of course, Gibson is a specialist. And many, like many, like many um, uh, writers, I would assume he's sort of a generalist. He knows a fair amount of many kinds of science, and and he pr gave us this vision mm. of what essentially mm. our life today would would be like. Mm, mm. Uh, Joachim Vrethed, you wrote your doctoral thesis about the Irish author uh, John Banville yeah. and his trilogy of books uh, based on the lives of some of history's most famous scientists, Nicolaus Copernicus, uh, Johannes Kepler and Isaac Newton. Can you explain why you find this work so interesting? Yes, I think there are mainly two things that I'd like to bring to this discussion. I think that uh, the first thing would be what Banville himself was interested in, and we can take Copernicus as the first example. And I think it is the affinities between the creative artist on the one hand and the scientist on the other. Uh, if we take Copernicus as the example, in the novel he gets his idea sort of out of the air, or from the gods, if you wish, uh, but then he tries to make his science fit the idea. And that turns out to be a very difficult process, and it's even impossible because it's, he's still counting on circular planetary motions, and there are not, they are not circular. So that's why he gets lost on the way, and he can't really get his science to fit the idea. And I think that Banville saw affinities between this process and the creative process of the artist. You know, you mm. can get an idea for a novel project, and, but then you have to write the novel as well. And I think the creative imagination is the common denominator there, I think. Yeah. Uh, what do you think we can learn by studying how science and scientists are, are portrayed in fiction? Can they tell us something about <coughs> science, for instance? Yes, I think so. We can see throughout literary history how uh, science pushes fiction and fiction pushes science. So there's a reciprocal kind of process going on. And I think what we also can see is for every utopian narrative that you get, you get about you know, a dozens of 
dystopian narratives. So it seems as if we as human beings, we are almost obsessed with trying out the worst case scenario for, for any kind of innovation. And why that is, I'm not sure. Maybe that's a question we could discuss. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I do have to follow up with this. Uh, it, is it correct that Johannes Kepler actually wrote the novel uh, published after <coughs> his death, Yes. possibly the first science fiction novel. What was this about? Yes, it's arguably the first science fiction narrative that's been written. It's called Somnium. And it's very interesting for one reason especially, that in his science, in, he wrote a book called Astronomia Novum. And in that, in his science, he was onto the idea of gravity, but he couldn't quite pinpoint it in his science. But then when he wrote his imaginative fiction, uh, which is called Somnium, which is about a trip to the moon, and he sees astronomy from the perspective of the moon, then he took gravity for granted. So something he couldn't really pinpoint within his science, he could write about in his fiction. So this means that Kepler the scientist inspired Kepler the writer. So that's quite interesting, I think. That's exciting. Mm. So Sabine, you've said that you believe that there is a need for the academic world uh, to open up uh, even more to ideas from other sectors. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it's already happening. Science is leaving the ivory tower and of course, those are good examples from the past, but I'm, well, I'm a historian of science and I can, I've tried to look at these longer trajectories and uh, what we see, I think, right now is um, a, uh, a leaving of the traditional disciplines, these little kingdoms of academic expertise that have worked for a long time, recruiting, educating, students in a very strict way, making them specialists in particular fields. And these compounds, I think they worked until the mid 20th century max, maximum, but they don't any longer. So then we had the hyphenations, you know, biotechnology, geoecology, business engineering. And it seems that, does, that doesn't work any longer either. So now we were facing problems that are of a scale or well, global, in scale, think of global environmental change, climate change issues, urban growth, human habitation, migration, of a kind that they cannot be addressed any longer by these disciplinary fields. So I think that new solutions and also new collaborations are asked for, and that is increasingly happening um, uh, at the moment. Otherwise, we perhaps wouldn't sit here in, in a crosstalks uh, mm. TV screening of this kind. Uh, we discuss across the boundaries of what we somehow were secure of and knowledgeable of. And, and that's this very interesting. The last thing you say there, that, that, that we have to approach to have these conversations. We have to approach in some way the limits of our, of our knowledge. Or we have to step outside our field of expertise to take in uh, the opinions of others. But perhaps we are still most safe doing it across scientific disciplines. What is the role of, of art, do you think, in this context? Well, um, since well, you, you've uh, inserted wonderful examples here of Kepler and also the neuromancer um, of uh, inspiration, but I, I wouldn't want to see this as a sort of a top-down process of, well, here's science presenting results and problem solutions, and then also take in some inspiration from other sectors or other fields, but rather inspire or invite bottom-up processes of uh, collaboration that need to be done in another way. And I think we're just now trying to find how these ways could work. I mean, mm. outside of KTH, outside of this main building, we, we see this dome of vision. It was just recently erected to create space for sustainable ideas. And I do hope that this will be uh, indeed a bottom-up process of inviting um, people from all over the place, different institutions, art mm. perhaps, um, politics, economics, to, to think together, to discuss what is needed, whether it's city planning or uh, the future of sustainable well, mobility or something. Mm. So if we do... It, Look back a little bit still at the hi historical context. Science has traditionally perceived itself as self-sufficient uh, mm -hmm. in some way, uh, uh, a fountain of truth, not, mm -hmm. not uh, necessarily as much as searchers for the truth, but actually the ones that deliver uh, mm -hmm. knowledge. Uh, 
Why do you think that is? Uh, and, and is it, we're saying well, it needs to change, but do you find this actually changing uh, in your institutions? Mm. Mm, well, um, yes, it's changing and uh, it needs to change, but there's still a lag, I think, in how the academic world and the financing and the structure is working. So if you're working very um, cross-disciplinary and in huge teams, it's very difficult. It's difficult to get funding, it's difficult with uh, uh, publication, it's difficult... I mean, there's lots of things that doesn't really um, work so well with the academic system. Uh, so there's... Uh, uh, we need to uh, develop the structures for that better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, but this kind of very sharp specialist knowledge is is also needed. So I think academy, the academy is probably adjusting, uh, but as mm -hmm. always with the academy, it's, it happens uh, quite slowly. <laughs> mm -hmm. In this tradition uh, of, of the ideal of science, this is uh, still reflected also in, I think, how we portray scientists in fiction, often a brilliant lone mm -hmm. wolf, typically mm -hmm. still a male, mm -hmm. who does brilliant uh, work mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. it, was this ever true? How true is this now? It's not true. I think most of what we do in our department is teamwork nowadays. Mm. But rewarded or awarded is the one person. Think of the Nobel Prize that is given always to, well, maybe one or maybe two people mm. or three max mm. for one big discovery. The teamwork is usually invisibilized then uh, at some point mm. and when one particular scientist sticks out for his or her publication. So I think that the perception, also the self-perception of science is still following this, uh, well, the lone genius mm. uh, image. Mm. And you can also see that in fiction mm. where scientists are presented. So where does, where does this image persist? Yeah, but I think uh, it, it actually has a, a, a real background because it says about Kepler that the first time around he had give, gave a course at the university. He had six students there. But he, his mind trailed off all the time and the next term he had zero students. So he gave his <laughs> lectures to himself. So I think the image has some kind of real background, I suppose, yes. So, yeah, and it's... Uh, it has changed. It's, it's very much a collaborative process today, mm -hmm. but th it's amazing how the image in film and in media is still so focused on this lonely male, heroic or maybe crazy mm -hmm. uh, scientists that... Uh, mm -hmm. The mad scientist yeah. that is sort of it's, the it's, other it's extreme like a form. favorite yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the persona in, in film. Mm -hmm. I realize I do have to check, do any of you know any mad scientists? F only from film. <laughs> <laughs> Joachim yeah. looks a little bit Frankenstein. Yeah, I was, I was actually <laughs> thinking seriously, but, uh, <laughs> well, I think they're mostly from, from fiction. And I think that fiction has actually created this mad scientist to some great extent also. I'm thinking about uh, uh, Victor Frankenstein, yeah, for I instance. I was thinking of mm -hmm. Frankenstein. Who is sort of monomaniac. He's just want to create life. That's his sole project in life, and he neglects everything else. And, and neglects his private life as well, and the e cost oh can, yes. be, can oh be limitless. Yes, that's yes. Right. yes. So... Um, uh, so, uh, so what about counterexamples? Uh, do you think fiction and popular culture then can help change this image? Uh, that would probably serve academia well, and certainly it would, it would serve female researchers well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do think it could happen, but it's not happening enough yet. So just thinking of new examples or recent examples mm. of, I was thinking of the day after tomorrow, mm. grand, you know, global climate change uh, topic, and we still see a lone warrior, this male, yeah. <laughs> white, yeah. Yeah. US yeah. head of the family, mm. who is the lone warner of this mm. re reversal of the Gulf Stream, oh, yes. and, uh, and then he sort of becomes some sort of national hero, of mm. course. So, that is very conventional in a way, and Hollywood mm. blockbusters work in this yeah. way. But you could also think of some yeah. 
like also more recent examples of Contact, for instance, this mm. movie from 1997, mm. or Prometheus, the 2013, mm. where mm. we had female scientists in the lead. And mm. I think we will see more of that, also more teamwork. I'm sure mm. we'll s m see more teams mm. uh, in the future of these uh, sort of science fiction blockbusters. Sarah? Yeah. yeah, I was just saying that even in recent Swedish uh, television series, like uh, Ekta Menniho, Real oh, yeah. People, mm. then there were this uh, uh, scientist that was so uh, upset about his wife drowning, so he made her into a robot that could have feelings, and then mm -hmm. this puts a sort of chain into action. So he it was lonely and he was kind of mad in a way. Yes, that's mm. very interesting because, of course, that might just as that could uh, just as well be a, a, a female scientist yeah. who is grieving for a husband, mm. but that mm. seems like a very unrealistic storyline. Yeah. At least it would be very unlikely for us mm. that we'd get to see that. Mm. Mm. Uh, so uh, you worked uh, uh, on a project called Life 2053, mm -hmm. uh, which you describe as trying to create a vision of the future that is somewhat positive. Uh, can you that uh, is positive? I that, would is, say. that is positive. So, so <laughs> yeah. not dystopian, I guess. Mm. Then, yeah. But is it actually utopian? Is it very positive outcomes that you're looking for? Well. Um, yeah. I don't think uh, we try to make a, a, a vision of the future that would seem natural and kind of based on people's everyday life. Um, because we wanted to have we, something that, um, a vision that works, a, a counter vision towards all these dystopian and catastrophic future images that we are surrounded of by, by um, in media, in film and in literature everywhere. And we know that these kind of visions about the future actually form how the future becomes, because we can't imagine something that is not there. We use the images that are around to imagine uh, the future and what to do with the future. So we, we need images of the future that about a sustainable future that is positive and where people are happy and where there's a, a, a well-being, mm. even if we, on the same time, can't uh, consume as much or use as much energy and maybe don't fly to everywhere in the world all the time. Mm. So we wanted to do this um, vision or present it, but not not like from a top down, but from a rather from a, an everyday perspective. So what you do here is that you, you sort of try a, a day in a lifetime in, in 2053. Where How? you can choose well, you can go in there and it's You've on built the web. It physically. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's you know it's images and okay. texts and so. But you uh, you go in there and you choose your lifestyle. You choose where you live and how much money you earn and how much uh, time you have. So it's also a way of showing that you can actually live have different lifestyles even in a sustainable future, and it doesn't have to be only built on sacrifices, like mm. it's cold, it's boring, mm. it's, you can't eat anything, and <laughs> you, know, you go back to mm. middle age. Mm. 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 When envisioning the future, uh, where did, did you draw the inspiration? Uh, who, who, who decided on what the future would be in this project? Oh, that was really a collaborative work <laughs> with the researchers and game developers and designers and uh, all kinds of people. And we looked a lot about from, of, of gaming, science fiction and films, but we, we also were very much inspired by, for example, the Stockholm exhibition 1930, uh, where there they were uh, tr trying to solve the problem of, of housing shortage, because they were, mm. yeah, uh, that was the big issue then in the 1920s. So what they did was to show that we can build a good, um, uh, small but functional and hygienic uh, flats with uh, bathtubs and kitchens for everybody and, and this could be a future that we could have. Yeah. And because it was real and it was there and it was like exhibition, you could walk into it, it had enormous impact on uh, Sweden's development. Yeah. It's and funny, it's, it really did become the standard of, yes. of, of life here. Now, of course, mm. it's, it's very difficult to think that this functionalism was once futuristic. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm. Mm. Let's, let's bring in uh, another guest. Joining us now via Skype is Chad Orzel, physics professor at Union College, New York, and author of the books How to Teach Physics to Your Dog, How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog, and How to Teach Relativity to Your Dog. Welcome to Crosstalks, Chad. Thank you very much. You must have one very well-educated dog. 
<laughs> yeah, she's she's pretty sharp. She's a uh, uh, German Shepherd mix, and uh, you know, very uh, very inquisitive as as dogs tend to be. And this this worked out pretty well as a hook for some books. Uh, your work as an author has been about communicating science to non-scientists, uh, including human non-scientists, using imagery and stories taken from everyday life. So, how does this how, and the dog? How how does this everyday idea um, help you explain physics to your readers? Well, one of the the biggest obstacles to people understanding relativity and quantum mechanics is that they they seem really weird. Right. It, it, they they run counter to your everyday experience. And, and that's largely due to human preconceptions about how things should work. But, you know, if you look at the world the way a dog does, right, a dog sees the world as a, a source of amazement and wonder. If if you come at physics from that angle, it's a lot more appropriate. Maybe you have an example uh, of this. Well, for example, it, in quantum physics, in quantum electrodynamics, there are these virtual particles that pop into existence from the vacuum. And, um, you know, if, if a bag of dog treats popped into existence in the middle of my kitchen, I would be kind of freaked out by that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my dog has been waiting for that to happen for 10 years. <laughs> and she would just feel vindicated. Mm-hmm. And so from the dog perspective, that's less weird. And it provides a way in for people who aren't already scientists. Uh, You've said that you liked reading science fiction that you were younger and that you still do. What do you think makes these stories resonate with you? What I really like to see in the, in the genre is sort of uh, the working out of some idea, right? So, so people latch onto some scientific concept and will say, okay, let's, let's take this you know, to its extreme and, and see how does that apply to interesting situations. And I think that's, that's something that goes on in science uh, and also in science fiction, that some of the the most you know indelible images from physics are these thought experiments that people like Einstein or you know, infamously Erwin Schrödinger, the cat box, mm. right? They they imagine these scenarios and then talk about okay, this is what would happen in that scenario, and that, that's really attractive. Do you do you, there is there is this idea? I mean, of course, some some even some concepts in uh, come to think of it in physics, like the Big Bang or or um, uh, dark matter, th- that are quite poetic. Uh, I, I've never thought of it this way, but but actually, there is an overlap in some way between literature mm. and and science. Mm. You're all nodding. Is, is, would anyone like to come in on this? Mm. Uh, Sabine, is, is there an overlap? Well, I, I like this observation that it's poetic, mm. um, which I really, yeah, I appreciate that. Mm. <laughs> this, but it's also science and fiction can also create a very closed universe around these big, big questions that make it really hard to access when you're the lay person or the mm. dog or you know mm. any <laughs> mm. uh, any any lay uh, a lay person on the in the field and and, and that I find is hard to uh, crack open mm. this uh, this 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 kind of connection mm. b- that is around the very spectacular big big questions and uh, I I also really appreciate here Chad's approach of. Um, Breaking this down to something that is bricolage, that is doing the bits and pieces and mm-hmm. learning, uh, and in this way creating access for for everyone, mm-hmm. and not making it a very mm-hmm. exclusive uh, project. Okay. But I I, I uh, feel sympathetic towards the analogy between dark matter uh, within physics and dark matter within literature, because it's something that we try to get at, but we don't quite get there. It's something that we can only see or measure in, the, in, the, in terms of science, the effects of, but we can't really see what it is. And I think there is even a book called The Dark Matter of Words. So this, um, okay. I mean, uh, really complex texts have this, this kind of quality, I think. Um, uh, mm. If we're on a, on a sort of practical level, is there anything, Chad, for instance, that you've you learned from science fiction that you can use in your scientific work? Well, like I said, a lot of the, the quantum pioneers, people like Einstein, Niels mm. Bohr, uh, like that, they they did a lot of the same sort of extrapolation of ideas, of mm. saying, okay, you know, here's a weird thing that happens on the microscopic scale. 
what if we could make that macroscopic, then what would we see? And there's a lot of things that are very strange when you, you get to these extreme situations of very, very small things where quantum mechanics applies or very, very mm -hmm. big things where general relativity applies or very small, very big things where both of them apply, where it, you, you can't think about it as something concrete that you, you deal with. You have to work in analogies mm -hmm. and uh, sort of metaphors and analogy that, that, that are very literary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. It, what about uh, what about you guys? You have have you learned anything from science fiction that you <laughs> that you mm. use? Not immediately, but uh, I agree that um, to break it down on a level that a human being can understand these big, very big or very small qu questions, that is when we can sympathize or empathize. This is what I learn. Like, it's the, the, the function of the narrative or the story that we need something to understand, to, to feel. So it's difficult to feel a formula or to empathize with the idea that E equals MC squared or something. We can idolize it, but it's hard to, to understand on this em uh, empathic mm. level, I find. So, so communication is clearly one thing that... that uh, the science community they can learn from popular culture, just the meaning of narratives and, and metaphors. Uh, yeah. Are there others, Sara? Well, um, um, maybe something different. I was, I was thinking about a, um, some 20 years ago, there were a lot of discussion in, in science fiction about um, the uh, symbiosis between machines and, and a human being, and also the idea of the cyborg. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very fascinated by that, and in the research team that I was in that, when I was, I was a PhD student at the Interactive Institute, we, we uh, developed a, a, a product based on this idea, where we're trying to, to interact with machine in another way. So we designed a game called Brain Ball that measured the brain activity. And uh, the idea was that you competed not in activity but in relaxation, mm -hmm. so uh, and not in being <laughs> active or, or not in your, with your mind, but rather with your body and with your and trying to control your body by being relaxed. <laughs> uh, so that was another way of of, uh, uh, of actually making this idea um, uh, uh, tangible and materialize it. Uh, which uh, is something you can do in design or, or art. I, this idea of the cyborg, uh, you're right, was it was very mm -hmm. dominant. And of course, mm -hmm. I mean, people who are old enough will remember when the Terminator series started and, and yeah. all of these ideas of the sort of, I mean, the human machine uh, meld somehow. Now, we are in some some sense, the metaphorical sense is all cyborgs. And, mm. and some people, of course, including people with, with cochlear implants, for instance, are mm. in a practical way cyborgs. But we don't tend to call that it that anymore. Mm. Uh, have we stopped being afraid of the human machine meld? In one sense, we have made it our own. We have uh, empowered it and made it, uh, we're not afraid of it because it's not alien in the same sense. Mm. But there are other issues that we are, are uh, confronting, like, like uh, uh, the real uh, people, the, the robots, for example, mm -hmm. that are very uh, similar to human beings, what will happen then, mm. or the X-Men thing where uh, you know, your genetically is changing right, and right. what is happening to human beings then. Mm -hmm. So are there other issues? Maybe you can have other ideas on that. No, it's uh, back to that. It, yeah. Uh, Chad. Yeah. No. Chad. Uh, I, just wanted to say, I think there's a sense in which a lot of these things are kind of a moving target. And mm -hmm. I have a, a colleague in computer science who made a, a comment a while ago about artificial intelligence. And it said, you know, if you go back mm -hmm. 40 years people would say that the hallmark of artificial intelligence would be being able to make a computer that could play chess, mm -hmm. that could beat a human at chess. Mm -hmm. And I said, these days, right, you don't teach that in a course on artificial intelligence. You teach that in a course on algorithm design mm -hmm. because it turns out to be a problem that's really easy. And we have computers no human can beat the game of chess. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we no longer think of that as artificial intelligence. We've just pushed that farther down. That's right. You so can, something yeah. like a cochlear implant isn't thought of as, as a cyborg because it's it's ordinary, mm -hmm. right? yeah. and cyborg is still a little further down the road. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm. And I think it's the, the thing that I uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, dystopian narratives is somehow a process for us probably to get used to new ideas. So we, we think out the worst case scenario to sort of get over some kind of threshold. I think uh, uh, that's one way of seeing it anyway. But it, it, it is interesting that dystopian narratives mm. are so dominant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I realize that probably has narrative reasons as well. It's, it's mm -hmm. more easy to tell stories Dramatic. about fear yeah. than, about, mm -hmm. than about friendship, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, we do tell some great stories about friendship as well. So I, I don't mm -hmm. see why utopias uh, are so underrepresented. What could some of the reasons for this be? I don't know, but I know there is one uh, interesting example from literary history, and it is one utopian written by Francis Bacon. It was published in 1627, and it's called The New Atlantis. And this typically the narrator reaches uh, an alien civilization, and their society works so well, and science is really central in the society. So science works wor very well in that society. And then later, uh, Jonathan Swift, of course, satirizes this in Gulliver's Travels. I think it is in part three. He reaches the island of uh, the flying island of Laputa, and there you have all all the all the male population are mad scientists. They walk around. They can't even function socially at all. Any of them. So it's totally full of mad scientists. So he satirizes uh, the Baconian idea. But then the funny thing is that uh, Swift uses all of the idea of the flying island of Laputia on current science, on uh, experiments on, on magnetism. So in satirizing the idea, <laughs> he's using science. So it shows the interrelatedness of, of the two fields in a way. Mm. But Sabine, you wish, sorry, yes, uh, Chad. I, I was gonna say, I, I think that the biggest issue with dystopia versus utopia is it's it's hard to have a story without conflict. Right. Mm. Mm. And if you have yeah. a, a really utopian situation, you have less conflict. Mm. There are interesting examples of people who have written arguably utopian futures. Uh, the Scottish author Ian Banks is a, is a really good example. He has a, a lot of in the culture which is an extremely advanced civilization that's arguably a utopia, but to make stories about it, he tells those stories on the fringes of the culture where it's encountering other less advanced civilizations. And that's where the conflict comes from. Mm -hmm. And obviously Star Trek would be an example of a sort of optimistic 60s mm -hmm. science fiction idea that, that still lives on, but obviously the story is that we tell in that universe tend not to be so much about how all of the nations are friends with each other and, and production and, and energy are limitless. Uh, for it. They do tend to be about war. Mm. Uh, I wonder, Sabine, it, you've looked a little bit about, about uh, utopia, at historic ideas. Uh, well, I was thinking uh, and agreeing with Chad here and also Joachim uh, of the, um, well, utopia is the no place, right? That mm. is what it means as defined by Sir Thomas More, 1516 in this book, Utopia. So it's an ideal place. It's so idealized. This island of order in a sea of chaos. Mm. So no wonder mm. Bacon's Atlantis is an <laughs> island yeah. as well. Yeah. So humans are not made to be so perfect. They're imperfect, they're fallible. And uh, so hum I, I think humanity is not allowed to inhabit this utopian no. space, really. So it must remain ideal. And uh, instead, uh, well, dystopia offers itself to much more dramatic storylines here, as you said. So you can have the post-apocalyptic survivor community, just a few people, everything in ruins. And then you can still end on a hopeful note. So they get a second chance mm. to start from scratch. Mm. And we just love these second chances. But it's we so don't want to yeah. endless forever mm. live in a state of yeah. order where everything works. Yeah. But, but, but the second chance is about a second chance to make a utopia, or, at or at least a functioning well, society at least somehow. some sort of a functional society. So, so we yeah. do need the goal. So, and yeah. when Star you come to think of it, we did spend a big part of the 20th century in a conflict between two, two um, uh, conflicting ideas of, mm. of what utopia could be, a sort of communist ideal, uh, and, uh, and the idea of, uh, of the perfect 
uh, consumer society. Mm -hmm. uh, and neither of those, uh, it turns out, could quite, we, we, neither of the systems could deliver, but also neither of those utopias uh, turned out to be as perfect as, as theoretically presumed. So, mm -hmm. so that there is, don't we need a utopia to strive towards? I, I worry that mm -hmm. we seem to be lacking. That we, don't have, we don't have a lot of stories of what it could be. Mm -hmm. The, the poetry line, uh, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I uh, just uh, in uh, the coming days, there's a seminar in uh, about art and how art should uh, relate to the issue of, of sustainability because art is, has sort of withdrawn from that. So there's a lot of artists and, and writers and, and film people there. So it's an issue. It, it, there is a lack of, of, uh, of good visions and of artists engaging mm. in, in these visions. That's, uh, that's true, and it's a problem. And I would also like to comment on, on uh, the, how uh, environmental activists are portrayed in, in, in films and huh. television series, because they are often, or mo almost all the time, seen as some kind of maniacs, sociopaths. They start out as idealists, and then they turn into these uh, terrible people who murder, and their anxiety, and they end up in prison. So that's the kind of dominating view of you know, what an environmental activist is. And of course, that's uh, also influencing our own perceptions about uh, these people. Joachim. Mm -hmm. mm. I think there's... Yeah. <laughs> We're doing this all the time. There's also... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, Chad, you go ahead. Okay, yeah. Chad, you go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, there, there's also sort of a psychological bias toward regarding uh, negative things as more serious than, than positive ones. That if you present a, a, an idea that, you know, this technology is going to revolutionize the world and make everybody's lives better, people are like, well, you know, you're just a booster, Pollyanna stuff, and, you know, mm. go give a TED talk, and then, you know, <laughs> the serious things. Here's how this technology is going to doom us all in the future. And that gets that gets weighted as more worthwhile uh, in a lot of senses, mm -hmm. and so I think that influences things as well. It's it's seen as more serious to say that this is a threat than it is to say this is wonderful. Look at this cool thing. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are also living in this, I almost said age, but I guess the last hundred years have been this age at least, of, of, of uh, this astounding techno-optimism mm. that, that, that even though we tell all of these dystopic stories and even though mm. we are worried about the threats, in fact, the, the sort of cultural norm seems to be mm. that, that technology is generally speaking good and is, mm. is going to, to lead to a better place. Why, why is this then? How do we resolve this conflict? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. We talked a little bit about it, Sabine. We I think did. I think we ideas. talked about <laughs> the gadgets that we all so much love. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking of, okay, wearable technology and then these optical head-mounted devices and you have all the information just on your glasses mm -hmm. and you can have your Bluetooth mm -hmm. device sewn into your clothes or under your skin and become a cyborg again. So we yeah. are, we're, we're cyborgs with what we wear and how mm. we sort of inhabit this world. Mm. Mm. And that is what we love and mostly find unproblematic. Yeah. Uh, but mm. the, the, that is what I think is science fiction, does science fiction not address? So science fiction addresses much larger uh, questions, uh, not so much on the the gadget level, like that we all know that the first tablet computer was first seen on the Enterprise somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we, we, we've, we've seen it all in Star Trek. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but that is not what is at stake, I think, when, when it's about the politics and really the, the, these large social cultural questions of um, what technology or science and techno-science will will bring. That's on the, on the level of whatever, genetically modified mm -hmm. organisms, mm -hmm. uh, genetic engineering, um, biomedicine, um, cloning. So mm -hmm. those are the monsters that mm -hmm. we're dealing with <laughs> nowadays, not mm -hmm. your Bluetooth device or mm -hmm. not your cord power cordless mm -hmm. charger or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, I also think that there's a difference between how these issues are treated within art and in, in 
technological research. Uh, because in, in art, uh, there's generally uh, a critical view uh, of uh, well, technology and the future, etc. Uh, but in within the, the sort of science community, and there's much more of an optimistic view. And maybe that's the actual, some kind of the, the, the meaning of art to be more critical. And uh, I, I think that in the, in the science community, there's a lot of very uh, optimistic uh, ideas about the future, how energy, for example, how we will be saved by technology. And we don't really have to do anything. Uh, we just, technology is just going to save us like a, mm. you know, on a white horse coming riding and kind mm. of, if we are, covering Sahara with solar panels, and you could build the third generation nuclear power plants in Siberia because it needs to be really cold areas. Mm -hmm. And then you have these enormous cables going all over the world and kind of just distributing the energy. So that would be solved, you know, mm -hmm. no problem. And, uh, <laughs> and people, you know, I heard people say that completely, um, Serious. So, so I'm, I'm interesting. Uh, this is anecdotal, but I, mm -hmm. I find uh, I, I work a lot in the cultural world, and I find that that artists and people with a lot of power in the cultural sphere tend to be late adopters of new technology. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and for instance, it, it sometimes for instance it seems that everybody in the society plays digital games, except for powerful people in the culture sphere. They're still worried. <laughs> and everybody else is doing it, including your grandma. <laughs> um, and, and I think, I wonder if the reverse is true. Is it also so that people with a lot of power in the scientific sphere are not big consumers of, of the fine arts, for instance, or, or, mm. or culture in general? Mm. That's sort of your C.P. Snow, uh, the two cultures problem, mm. right? That, that uh, science and the arts don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I, my experience has been that, that top scientists and people who are, who are very capable physicists tend also to be interested in the arts. They, they like music, they like art, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. They tend not necessarily to be uh, early adopters of technology, frequently because they're, they're so preoccupied with what they're doing scientifically that they don't really pay that much attention to, you know, Angry Birds doesn't penetrate physics a whole lot. <laughs> so then they're more like artists in that sense, I, I see, I see. I think so. Hey, sometimes uh, when new research projects are presented or even new gadgets come out, people will say sometimes, often people will say, wow, this is like science fiction. Does that ever happen to you guys? Sabine is laughing. On the gadget level, it does happen <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I was thinking of this uh, recently on the news, the, the battery charger for this hybrid car that is without cord nowadays. And I was wondering, okay, will we have cordless energy transmission in the future? I wonder how this will work. Mm -hmm. It works for batteries. When will be the cordless power supply? When will we have it? I don't know how to solve this problem physically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, um, well, it will simplify our lives, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, some some aspects sometimes come up on the news, and I think. Oh, wow. what, what about Chad? Do you do you think? Wow, this is science fiction about our time. Oh, definitely. I, I, you know, just this week, right? The you know story of we found water on Mars, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's a real living in the future moment, right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend sure. to want to think of myself as as not being a technophile, but then this morning I looked at my watch and I found out that. It is water resistant down to 100 meters. And then I thought, whenever will I go down 100 <laughs> meters in the water? So, yeah, yeah. And, I, so, and this technology on your arm is probably like 70 years old, and you're shocked. Yes, about yes like probably, that. probably, yes. <laughs> yeah. What about Sarah? Do you, are you well, astounded at living in the future? I'm, the, I'm waiting for the self-cleaning home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's been promised for so long. It's, it's, it's sort of What's the sort of jetpack moment. Where's my jetpack question of, of the real world? <laughs> where's my, where's my self-cleaning home? Yeah. But do you think that generally that, that the way science and info innovation are portrayed in popular culture affect um, consumers' relationship to, to technologies and, and to these kinds of changes? Yes. yes, in general. Yes. Yes. yes, in general. Mm. So there, there is, st there's still, and of course, I mean, we can't ask uh, artists to take a lot of responsibility 
for that, but mm. there's, there is there's some interesting area there that seems to be covered by neither side. Mm. So uh, I, I realized uh, I've almost forgotten to, to bring up something super important. Uh, you've said when we discuss innovation, we tend to discuss technology. Mm. Uh, but mm. social in innovation, beha behavioral innovation, uh, are, equally, are equally important to discuss. What do you mean by this? Well, uh, for example, uh, in a sustainable future, even if uh, we need technical development and it will help us a long way, we also need to change the way we are living. And we need to uh, really to, to think deeply about this. How are we living? Uh, how we are traveling? How we're spending our vacation? How, uh, how uh, our life is going to be? Uh, because technology is not being able to save us, even if right. we would like that to happen. It's not going to, to happen, because it, there's too much to need to be changed. And even if technology will help us a long way, we have to be willing to, to take on the technological changes that they are providing. So we also need um, social innovation and behavioral innovation. Mm -hmm. th th and the question is how, how that is done. Whose job is it? Because because we do research mm. behaviors, but mm. we don't teach designing behaviors. Mm. It, that sounds, unless you go to advertising school. Exactly, and that's yeah. my point, that uh, there's not really anybody doing that. Yeah. And um, so what uh, we, we talk, you, today we are either um, innovating and development technically, or we are providing information for people on how they should shop or insulate mm. your homes or etc but but there's very few that are actually uh, designing or, or innovating uh, socially mm. Mm. i realize we only have a few minutes left of the program do, do we have an audience question yes please take the go to the stand and state your name and affiliation yeah Uh, my name is Fredrika Helgren. I'm a medical student at Karolinska Institutet. And my question is, because we talked about how art and books can influence the future, do you think then that people who write science fiction, for instance, have sort of an ethical responsibility in what they create? That's a very good question. Thank you, Fredrika. Yes, okay. I think that the writers themselves would definitely think that they have that, that kind of responsibility. And I could take Margaret Atwood as an example. She has really worked consistently with issues in her fiction that she think are questions that need to be addressed by the whole of uh, humanity. She wouldn't call her own fiction science fiction because she says it's speculative fiction because everything that she writes about could actually happen. So that's her um, stance on, on that. Yeah. I think, so I, I don't remember the specific person to attribute this to, but there's a, a well-known line within the science fiction genre saying that while science fiction appears to be about the future, the books and stories are always really about concerns of the moment. Mm. Mm. So, you know, you look at, at Star Trek, it, it's set far in the future, but they have episodes about, you know, there's that half black, half white aliens that, you know, it's really about civil rights. Mm. Mm. Uh, you look at a lot of the fiction today, it's set way in the future, but it's really about environmental concerns that are affecting mm. us now, yeah. or social justice issues that are affecting us now. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which fiction, the science fiction is always about now and, and addressing ethical issues of the present, regardless of sex. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, going to finish the show by asking you a question that I actually asked in the intro uh, about what some of the, the new leaps that we could imagine from, from the popular culture today. So perhaps you could all mention briefly a, a, a piece of fiction that you've read or watched that has given mm -hmm. you an interesting thought or a novel idea or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do a quick round uh, at the end. Chad, what, when, what uh, story has given you an idea recently? Uh, the two things I've read most recently have been uh, Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, where the moon blows up at the start of the story, and he plays that through, uh, which is it's a really interesting. And uh, in a similar sort of vein, The Martian, uh, which is oh, yeah. a movie mm -hmm. that's about to come out this week, uh, which I think is terrific. 
premiering mm. on Friday. Mm. 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 Uh, what about Sarah? Well, uh, I just saw this uh, Pixar movie, Inside Out, recently yeah. with my six-year-old niece, and I really like that. It's about how feelings um, work in our heads. So there are five basic feelings that uh, uh, sort of... Um, and it gave me some really... I think it was great. And it, uh, mm. it visualized very complex psychological phenomena in a way that's available for everybody. Really. Neuroscience for six-year-olds. Uh, yeah. Joachim, briefly. <laughs> yeah, sorry to bring in a dystopian novel here, but I came to think of uh, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake. Mm. And what I learned from that is to be careful with gene manipulation. <laughs> and briefly, Sabine, at the end. I read... Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's novel just recent uh, came out, uh, Aurora, about interstellar arcs, or these intergenerational spaceships, fraught with problems, tell us a lot about problems with our metabolisms on Earth, systems ecology, population ecology, and I'd like to take that, that up also in my own work. Uh, thank you. That's wonderful. That's all we had time for uh, this evening. Thank you, Sara Ilsted, Joachim Breathed, Sabine Höder and um, Chad Orzel. Crosstalks will be back next month with a new exciting topic. Until then, as always, be safe and be brave. <laughs>